Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Day Mystic Show. Our mission here is to help turn whatever you desire into real life manifestations by sharing our revolutionary technology to make that happen for you. We bring such cutting edge information through our resident wizard, Peter Shank, and also through such magical guests each week that are really making a difference to improve our lives on a variety of levels. I am your host, your co-host, Donna, along with the founder of the program and modern day mystic himself, Peter Shank. Peter, how are you today? Doing good, Donna. How are you? I'm great. It's a time difference, a <laughs> time change, so I hope everyone realizes what time. I, I only realized that when I look at my cell phone this morning. I was like, hmm, I slept late. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so and and I guess if they haven't figured it out by now in the in the evening, there's they probably should have gotten that by now. But anyhow, folks, we have a very incredible show for you tonight. We've got an awesome guest. He is all the way from Germany. So again, hence the time change <laughs> for him. And um, so we're going to bring him on. But before I bring on. Dr. Kaplan. I just want to talk a little bit before that, before him, and a little bit about him, and then we'll get back to Peter. So, Dr. Robert Roberto Kaplan is a doctor of optometry, a board certified in vision therapy. While a professor, he, he published over 30 clinical papers. In 1984, he stepped out of the mainstream vision care to research why are people's eyes failing them with massive increases in nearsightedness and eye diseases. His investigations took him to Peru, Australia, South Africa, Israel, Europe, where he integrated cultural healing systems into vision therapy. Since that time, he has published four books and most recently, has documented how energetic eye healing can help people take charge of their eyesight and seeing. Dr. Kaplan was born and raised in South Africa, where he was trained to use an artistic way of seeing. As an avid photographer, Dr. Roberto Kaplan today uses these images as a way of showing how precious our seeing is and to explain how the genes that dictate how the eyes function can be steered for better vision using very simple techniques. Dr. Kaplan directs the IC Life Institute near Stuttgart, Germany, together with his naturopathic doc doctor partner, Sarah Hayduck. They offer lectures, seminars, and professional, excuse me, professional trainings. So we're going to bring him on here as well. Peter, any updates for us about what MDM is going through and what we're doing? Oh my god, if I could get an intro like that every week, I'd love myself <laughs> even more. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of really cool things cooking up. Um, first thing I just want to briefly touch on is the HFA device, the harmonic frequency amplifier, a new way to travel. I should have prototypes of this device within two weeks depending on my contacts in Germany. Um, you know, one, once I get it and I play with it, obviously uh, we're going to do a whole show around it and uh, when we get inventory in and price points and, and everything else to go with it. So the, the HFA device is the first physical device I've ever created. So very, very excited about it. And obviously uh, I'll report to you everything that happens with it. We're also starting our third master class on Tuesday night and they have been over the top. People have been experiencing mind-blowing shifts in their reality directly related to teachings that have never been made public before, but I'm bringing them forth in the master classes. So we we're already planning round two of the master classes, and if you want to reserve a spot, you can contact Donna for that, and then when we're ready for it, obviously we'll let you know. Um, we also have the 33-day transformational guarantee coming out. This is going to be a cut above my regular energetic sessions. It's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen before. That's coming. We're doing a show, a special show around that on the April, tw I'm sorry, March 27th, Easter Sunday, uh, and of course we're going to have. 
deep discounts for that. We also have another workshop coming out within two weeks. There will be emails going out a little bit later in the week about this one. That's going to have a nice price point to it, probably about an hour, 15, hour and a half workshop around that. So that's kind of, oh, oh Aquaware 5 is coming. Yes. I'm, I'm, I don't want to say too much about it except, if you've seen anything, if you, you if you love Aquaware today, take that to the nth degree. Aquaware 5 is absolutely mind-blowing, and I really want to be clear about this. It is mind-blowing. The, the two updates to it are, are just spectacular. The, the current design is undergoing a complete rewrite from the ground up, obviously as is the engine, which means as the code gets tighter, the product gets more effective, but I'll probably be releasing a video within six weeks as a beta just to kind of show you where it's going. Absolutely mind-blowing. So, yeah, folks, there's a lot of stuff. We also have me and myself live coming up. Um, you know, we're still trying to book a place for it here in the New York City area. Now, if we don't settle on a venue that's live, what we are going to do is deliver it in a different format, meaning we're going to have an all-day event on something like this, but it'll be completely interactive. We're going to have three other guest speakers to be announced to be on that. It'll probably be a six to eight hour event, two hours a piece, and of course I'll be at the end. There'll be steep discounts across the board for that. A lot of uh, readings going on, a lot of energy work going on. So, you know, just we'll have potty breaks. You can go <laughs> do everything you want to do. So with that, Dr. Kaplan, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Well, I'm sorry that we had to wake you up, uh, you know, in the middle of the night in Germany there, but uh, we've got a large listening crew tonight. So tell us, sir, who are you and what are you about? Well, I, as uh, Donna was sharing earlier, I was trained in formal optometry, and my interest is always, uh, why do people's eyes still get worse after we do this conventional treatment? Uh, it seems to be that we can take care of cancer and we can take care of other health problems, but somehow the eyes, we, we think that we're just left uh, for them to fail. So as a doctor of optometry, um, you know, how did you explore healing the eyes and vision problems? How did all that come about? Well, I was, uh, I was at, at, in Houston, actually, at the University of Houston, where I was... Uh, first a graduate student and then a professor, and I had double vision 50% of the time. And I was diagnosed as one eye wandering out, and they said to me, well, you just have to use prism glasses, and there's nothing more we can do. But I had professors who were very uh, informed about vision therapy, which is a form of physical and physiological training, and I began that training. and. Finally, I reached a point where the success was good enough but not perfect, and I realized that there were emotional factors behind this physical eye problem. So it's almost like the eye, uh, the message I was getting through the eye was like a printout of something much deeper in my awareness, my perception. And that took me on a whole investigation on the west coast of America and in other cultures. That's very, very cool. So can you describe the connection between the eyes, brain, and mind? Absolutely. That's one of my favorite uh, questions for my patients. Well, how um, did I discuss this. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you're perfect. You're right <laughs> on. I mean, it's great. So it's like you know, if we look at this, this triad, the eye, brain, and mind, we realize that the eye, when we talk about the process of vision, the eye is only about 10% of the story. And the control mechanism is the brain, and then that's about 60%. So now we're only up to about 70%. And the rest is directed by what we call the mind. These are our awareness, our perceptions, our actual consciousness. So the eye is just a receptive transmitting system. But who we are in our core self is what really directs the view through the eyes, and that's how we make sense of reality. But you can understand that this is a, a model beyond normal medicine. It's, it's a whole person model that we have to begin understanding. So, in translation for that, like, why are so many people today needing to wear glasses 
in having these funky eye diseases? Well, this has been an investigation for about 40 years of my professional life and also my personal life because I, I also, at this stage of my life, use glasses. And that was one of the investigations at age 40, why do I suddenly need glasses? And it seems that the, the biology of the eye, and the brain, and our consciousness goes through cycles, usually about 20 years cycles. I wrote about this in the book, The Energetic Eye Healing. It's like there's a kind of a program within the eye functioning that's unfolding in front of our eyes, literally, and that in our first stage we have to really use uh, perceptions that are more thinking-oriented. And that's a part of our brain that we use. But later on in life, there are also feeling perceptions that come into play and emotional perceptions. And if we avoid these for very good reasons, survival reasons, um, the eyes print out messages. So, for example, in nearsightedness, short-sightedness, myopia, this is a kind of restrictive perception, a pulling inward of behavior. And we can measure this and we can provide therapeutic steps when it happens for the people and then they don't have to wear strong glasses. In some cases they don't wear glasses at all. So I, I've read over time that the eyes are just reflectors. That, so your vision comes in and, and the brain translates it. But from a, a higher consciousness perspective, how does that 3D reality get translated? What part of the brain is actually doing that? Well, it's, I think we have to start in a very simplistic way. We have to look at it in terms of light coming into the eye is carrying information. And the eye doesn't see and interpret that information. The eye simply uh, decides how to manage this light. How does the human being let the light in? Now, we have survival mechanisms in the brain, like the amygdala and other structures, that can edit the light that comes in. If, if the information cannot be managed that's coming in from the universe that's going to ultimately be interpreted, if we don't want to deal with that information, we can edit and decide not to let certain elements of that light in. If we allow the light in, it comes in in two forms. Centrally, in the macula of the eye, there is light that travels very fast, and that light is focused, and that light results in what we call thinking, understanding capabilities in the brain. On the other hand, if we take in unfocused light, that is, we allow it in, this light travels much slower and it acts as a connection to feeling. We feel what we're looking at. It's like the frame of a picture. The frame gives context to what the focus of our looking is. And ultimately, that goes deep enough and we actually can have an emotional response. Yeah, what a beautiful sunset. Oh, look at that tornado that's coming in my direction. And we make conscious reactions. We decide what we're going to do. Either we're going to so I, run... I go, oh my God! That's right, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly either that or we sit there and say, what a beautiful sunset. I'm going to sit here and enjoy it. This is consciousness deciding what to do with the information coming into the eye. Now that's only one part of the story. We've got two eyes. So if, if, if me and you were looking at the same thing, we would react differently. So if Donna started picking her nose, per se, we would react different to that, right? <laughs> I didn't see you do it, Donna. <laughs> That's right. That's our decision. Is it our brain decision? Do we direct the brain? And do we direct and con does the brain control the eyes? That's the point. So what I investigated was I wanted to measure this in the eye. I wanted to measure, and we as optometrists use a device called a retinoscope. This is a device where we shine the light in the eye, and we can see the reflected light off the retina. Well, that reflected light tells us what's going on in consciousness. If I say internal revenue service, the person's reflex from the retina is going to be very different than I say $1 million. Their consciousness is reflected and printed out 
by what they hear, what they feel, through the eyes. And the decision is made. That's a pretty cool thought. So here's a, a question that a lot of people are going to want answered. Are vision problems preventable? 80% of the time, yes. There seems to be a relationship between emotion and vision problems. The difficulty is we have to identify the cause, and this was one of my greatest challenges in my research. How do I, I can say yes, emotion affects vision, but how do I diagnose that? How can I have an objective measurement without taking someone through two years of psychotherapy to find the answer? Well, what I found out is the iris of the eye, the colored part of the eye, is a unique visual map that reveals not only genetic information, but also how the human being has dealt with their life perceptually. The color and the markings change over time. This can be photographed, measured, analyzed, and there's a whole therapeutic process that can be extrapolated from that information that deals with the cause, not the symptom. From that perspective, vision problems today, whether they are refractive problems or disease problems, can be more effectively prevented. So your work uses the iris of the eye to determine genetic conditioning that affects seeing. Correct. Can you explain this connection? When you take a baby who's born and you photograph the eye, there are certain structures that are fixed at birth, and there are other colorations that change during the maturation process, especially in the first 20 years. By identifying the interrelationship between three structures, we can find out where the human being has made survival adaptation choices. It's a map. It's like a GPS. It's a navigation system. And we can then ask very pointed questions, three, four, five questions, and find out exactly which emotions are of a survival nature, we then reprogram, we literally reprogram the perceptions. And while we do that, the person is looking at an eye chart. We are measuring the diopters. We are changing the prescription in front of their eyes. They are seeing the results on an eye chart that the eyesight is changing in the right direction, positive, being better. Normally when we test eyes, we test them to see how can we make the glasses stronger not the other way around. And so that's quite a big breakthrough. That's huge. So how does the consciousness relate to vision? Very good. So let's take a person, for example, right? They come they come in and they are near sighted, short sighted. So they wear special minus lenses to sharpen the eyesight. What we do is we find out uh, so when they wear their glasses, they have 100% clearness. So they have no real observation to know if consciousness is affecting their eyes. We weaken the glasses by a very des special design. So now they're looking through these glasses and they have, let's say, 80% clearness and 20% unclearness. So they walk out in, a, in their therapeutic glasses. We call them therapeutic glasses, training glasses. They go into their life and they walk into a fast food shop in the morning and have a quick breakfast, and they notice, oh, my eyesight just got worse. Or they come home from work, and they are confronted with a problem at home, and their eyesight gets worse. Or they go out for a run, come back, and their eyesight gets better. They have feedback, a visual biofeedback system, that tells them exactly what their consciousness is revealing through the eyes. So this actually becomes the training program that they use to modify perceptions of their consciousness. That's pretty <laughs> pretty amazing. <laughs> so, Dr. Kaplan, we're going to take a two-minute break. I just want to do a general blessing for everyone. And then there's um, a lot of questions forming over to social media, um, which we're going to be asking from the crowd here in a minute. So everyone like to get a glass of water quickly, please. We're just going to do a quick general blessing, goodwill. Take your left hand, raise it over the 
glass about three inches and spread your fingers, again, water has consciousness. And energy that is in physical form or not physical form would do anything for you as long as you acknowledge its existence. So the intent that we're going to be putting into the water through me is just one of general wellness. Feel good. I do this at the beginning of a lot of shows. It's just kind of, uh, you know, put everyone in that euphoric mood to absorb whoever the guest speaker is or any show that I'm doing um, the information. So again, left hand over the glass of water about three inches and spread your fingers. In about a couple seconds, you'll start to feel that energy run down through your hand into the water. It can come in the form of pinpricks. It can come in the form of the hand heating up, a tingly sensation. Other people kind of feel it in different areas of the body. Now, where you put your attention, the intention will go. I'd like everyone to go ahead and just put your attention on the water and repeat the words out loud, I honor the space in which you exist. We're acknowledging the consciousness of the water thereby allowing that energy flow to increase through your hand into the water. I'd like everyone to go ahead and drink as much as you want and notice the taste and the texture of the water. Make a note of where it's moving in your body energetically. Okay, Donna. Questions? <laughs> I have lots of questions. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of questions. Um, yeah, I, and oof. I was just in Facebook posting, but um, so let me start with a question from Becky since it's the first one that I can see right here. Becky wants to know, Dr. Kaplan is iridology, and maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. Iridology, um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank no you. No problem. No problem. That's part of your practice. You know exactly what I was talking about. It, it's a great question. I did see that on, on Facebook in your program, and I did respond, and I, I want to say that um, uh, I was exposed to iridology in 1979, and uh, I was in Houston. I was moving to the West Coast, to Oregon, and one of my students, I was a professor at the University of Houston, gave me this book on iridology, and I was totally fascinated by it. And uh, since then, I have taken iridology in its physical form and taken it to psychosomatic medicine. And now, more recently, we've been documenting it spiritually. So we've taken the original iridology and created a three triad process uh, of looking at the iris. And we've documented that the beginning form in the Energetic Eye Healing book. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then we have another question. And here's a comment. Here's a comment. It says, and you can maybe talk to this, love is my right eye. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Love is my right eye. My left eye is lust. Does that make wow. sense? Yeah, that's very provocative. Uh, I, I loved uh, the blessing that, that Peter just did because uh, he, he referred to the use of energy and focus and intention. Uh, this work with the eyes is all about energy. And so I can respond now by saying the following, and this is based on my research. It's also documented in my books. When we look through the right eye, we are accessing the energy of the father's side of the family. That is, we have direct access to perceptions of the masculine side of our history. This is an expressive energy. One could say an expression of love. On the other hand, the left eye is related to the female side of the family, our first female contact usually is our mother, so we build perceptions through the left eye, and that could also be love, and lust could actually be in both sides if we have that form of perception. That's a survival emotional perception. It's related to desire, want, greed, grabbing. The eyes don't like to grab, they like to receive the light. That's more of a loving expression. 
So it is conceivable that desire or lust is a survival perception that can handicap the functioning of the eye energetically. Ooh, that's powerful. So <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a here's a question that I really like. Eight 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 pioneer says, "What is it I don't want to see in my life?" Also, a great, great point, and uh, this happens a lot with my patients, and I turn it around, and I say to them, oh, you come in to see me because you really want to improve how you look through your eyes. My question to you is, what do you wish to see? Because if their eyesight improves, which it does, they are going to be confronted with that, what they constructed in their life, that no longer works. So they have to be very aware that as they become conscious, they are going to see the world through a different part of their awareness. Their third eye, the internal eye, the universal eye, and they're going to have to be ready to manage this new way of seeing. So I focus energetically on the positive. Yes, absolutely. So here's another question. This is from Valerie. She's saying, um, after a stroke, my eyesight improved. A few months later, I was back to needing eyeglasses. The stroke was due to, uh, to a prescription. A drug, a uh, prescription drug. Uh -huh. Well, I, I don't, I can't answer that question specifically because I don't know the history, but what I can tell you without any doubt is that uh, a medication can have a profound effect upon the functioning of the eyes. And the restoration process can restore the function. In some cases, it needs more advanced healing uh, approaches, either complementary or using food and other other concepts like home. we use homeopathic approaches in our practice in Germany. We use different forms of plant therapies and things like that to help restore function through the eyes. But I need more information. I can't know specifically. Yeah. Perhaps Valerie will give us a little bit more information okay. in the chat as well. And I like Patricia's. Um, she has more of a comment. Patricia wants to know. If you can um, give a shout out to your website, it's it's quite blurry. <laughs> I like that. Oh. <laughs> it's blurry. <laughs> you mean um, on the on the board? Yes. Well, it, it, they can access it. It's beyond 2020vision.com or robertocaplan.com. Both both will get them to the same place. Perfect. So here's a here's my question. Because, you know, when you were talking earlier about the eye kind of moving on its own, can you talk to us about some eye exercises? You know, as we age, can you talk about some eye exercises perhaps we can do or I can do? Right. Well, um, you know, there's, there's a, a definite biological but, change. I'm, I'm sorry. I have a quick question. Is that post-50 or after <laughs> <laughs> some some would say post forty. <laughs> exactly post forty. Not his eyes just turn red. <laughs> well, uh, you know we know we know in medical science that at age forty there is a measurable change in the eye, and um, people are using glasses for close work, and this is a phenomenon that's been around for a while. Um, what I investigated is why does this happen biologically? What what's the metaphor? I'll talk about that first, then I'll come back to Donna. Your point, Donna. Uh, the metaphor: everything that happens in the eye is happening for a reason. There is no accident. And so, when people have difficulties, symptoms with their eyes, or so-called problems, it, it's one thing to do the conventional approach treatment, but it's also useful to look at the metaphor behind the eye condition. And I've written about this in the books and. People can do that research. But in today's modern age of digital uh, living, there are certain preventive uh, practices. I call them practices. 
Uh, it's like a meditation practice. It's not an exercise that they can do. And I'll, I'll highlight uh, some of these now. Uh, one of them is to keep the eyes moving. So if you're on a screen, if you're on a smartphone, on a computer, just to, to move the eyes in different directions and check if there is a good breathing going on. Breathing oxygenates the blood. It brings nutrients, uh, vitamins and minerals into the bloodstream. And the eyes are quite far away. They need to be supercharged with good oxygen. The other thing that I find helpful on a physical level is, is aligned with what Peter was doing, and that is to, to start having a loving relationship with your eyes. Connect with them. Look in the mirror. Look at the left eye. Say, hi, left eye. How are you today? Look at the right eye. How are you? And, you know, I love you enough, and I'm going to really take care of you today and take breaks and, and close my eyes and rest them. And when I'm outside, I'm going to bathe you with a little bit of sunlight. And I'm interested in your well-being. You do such a great job for me. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and Donna, you remember we worked with the left eye and the right eye. That's another yes. Uh, people should be able to check, are they looking through both eyes? Uh, maybe you can just comment a little about your experience of that, Donna. Yes, you bet. So <laughs> I was asking um, Dr. Kaplan about, for my eyesight, and obviously over 40, so. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> I'm older than 40. <laughs> it's a long-running personal joke. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go back on mute, Donna. <laughs> Please. <laughs> good idea, good idea. So you were talking to me about using my thumb to kind of, you know, get my eyes. And for me... And, and I don't know if you just saw what I did. I led with my with my right eye, and so that was something that was was a big aha for me. Was which eye am I leading with? And I just did it again, and it's so unconsciously. And I tend to turn at least my head and then lead with my right eye when I'm talking, versus looking straight on, or with my left eye. It almost feels just really weird to look out of my left eye and not to be able to look straight. So I apparently over the years I've been going right in, instead of left. But you were talking to me about using my thumb to kind of come back into focus. And I, I thought that was pretty neat. And I was wondering if you can kind of share that technique. Yes. And I've been I've been working with that trying to Strengthen yes. my, my eye. Well, it's a very simple technique that if you, you put up your thumb and you look into the distance, if both eyes are participating, they're going to be two thumbs. And if you are balanced and in the middle, like you just shared, you'll be looking in between the two thumbs, right in the middle. If you're looking through one eye, the thumb will be positioned over one eye and you'll see one thumb more dominant. You're only one thumb. So it tells you exactly how to enter into a balanced view of life. Any moment of any day, you can check, where am I? Am I right eye dominant now? Am I left eye dominant? Am I balanced? And how do I feel? What's my consciousness? What's my awareness? All of that's available to every human being. And we can recalibrate, just like you said, recalibrate the head position by looking in between the two thumbs. I really like that because, you know, so much of what you do, Peter, when you talk about being conscious, um, this is just an, another ex exercise that I hope folks are, are really taking this to heart, another way to stay conscious and you can just check yourself <laughs> on a daily basis. Where am I? You know, I guess when you kind of see yourself getting... To be, to be you know, honest, I'm, when I'm playing with consciousness, I'm on the edge of consciousness at 200 miles an hour with my hair on fire. My eyes really don't play a part in it because I'm, I'm long past the physical at that point, you know. But when I come back, it is kind of an experience. But this is true what you're saying, Peter, because when we, we enter that high frequency of energy, that actually, as you asked earlier, becomes the impetus 
to send healthy messages to the physical eyes when we start going back to our life using our physical eyes. So what, it's a combination of those two worlds, the inner world and the outer world. And this practice is very dynamic and it's so much feedback telling you exactly where you are. Now, the only thing I want to mention, just in case there are people watching and listening who only have one thumb, don't be alarmed. That just means you're dominating through one eye. Even adults in their 70s can relearn uh, through either vision therapy or integrated vision therapy. I wrote about that in the book, The Power Behind Your Eyes. Integrated vision therapy can teach you the relationship between consciousness and reuniting the two eyes to work together. I love it. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> So the other important thing, the other important thing is that when you do these practices, Peter, the consciousness also then changes, and we become more aware. So it's another. Uh, we use this process as a means to guide people to more consciousness. I'd like to take five minutes out and do a light body activation tonight for everybody. That's okay with you. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back and we'll do some more Q and A. So I'm going to switch over to screen you know, share. No, I need the light body or something. Is that why you chose that? I, <laughs> I need that. Okay, so for the callers and the listeners and people watching the show, this is a product that came out early last year. It's called Light Body 2.0, and again, it uses the AquaWare 4 engine. And this particular product is all about body toning and losing weight and we've really had some spectacular results with it. I've debuted this on six or seven teleseminars over the last year and people have written in after purchasing it that they've had amazing results with it. And like all the technology, where you put your attention where you put your attention, the intention will go. So tonight we're gonna do a quick demonstration of inner beauty which is one of the seven or eight intents on here. Again we have fat loss, inner beauty, energy, appetite, metabolism, body toning, flush, <laughs> really be careful with this one, and of course the instructions. So these two guys up here, water preparation and user preparation. Water preparation removes the energy, the memories, and the structuring from the water from everywhere it's ever been. Really, really important so that we inject the intent into it. The water is returned to a pristine state prior to moving the intent into it. User preparation creates a thin veil inside the water and then when you drink it, it goes right to the subconscious mind and opens it up for acceptance. So I'd like everyone to go ahead and get a glass of water and we're going to do an inner beauty intent. Now, you know, people spend countless dollars on making the outside of their bodies look beautiful through exercise, through um, products that we put on our face and on our body to smell nice. Um, but what they don't realize is that the body has a natural frequency called inner beauty or unconditional love of self that emulates outwards. So if you've ever been in a crowded restaurant or on a bus or in a, in a busy place and someone walks into the vicinity and for a microsecond everybody gets quiet and they look at that person and then they continue on only for a fraction of a second. That's a person that exuberates unconditional love of self or this inner beauty. So we're right now we're going to do a live demonstration of it and it's in three parts. We're going to do water prep, user prep, and then inner beauty. So you'll need a glass of water and again folks the water does not need to be in front of your computer. There's no sound that comes out of this. The principles that govern the software are defined in the quantum realm and wherever you put your attention the intention will go. So that doesn't matter if it's a glass of water in front of the computer, or a case of water downstairs in the refrigerator, a case of water across the street or a body of water on the other side of the planet or a cup of coffee on Mars. It absolutely doesn't matter. Where you put your attention the intention will go. So I'll count backwards three two one all you have to do is put your attention on the water. We're going to be running water preparation three two one put your attention on the glass of water. Now, 
I want everyone to notice the water while the program's working. Sometimes it starts to get carbonated, sometimes it starts to bubble, sometimes it starts to vibrate, sometimes it will crawl out of the glass, sometimes it soaks through the glass. It really, really depends. The properties that govern this are incredible. Okay, that's water preparation. We've just removed all the memories from the water, every place it's ever been. We're now running user preparation. Okay, we're creating a thin veil inside the water. And this is goes right to the subconscious mind when we drink it. Open it up for acceptance for the intent to fall. Inner beauty is one of my favorite ones. There were some comments made uh, on some of the social media last week about it that were pretty funny. Okay, here we go. Inner beauty. Okay, I'd like everyone to go ahead and drink their water. And first thing you'll notice is the taste and the texture of it. Oh, that one tastes pretty good. Notice where the energy from the water is moving in your body. Okay, normally when I get in these moods, I like to do some off-the-wall things. So tonight, I'm offering 50% off this product. It's a $297 product. You can get it for $149. The, Q, the incentive for this show is 5-0 off show. You can use that in the online store on the MDM site. 5-0 off show. It's good for 48 hours, folks. Okay. Back to you, sir. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Even the German water tastes better. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? And, yeah. and all of these products are going to be moving into the fifth generation here. Aquaware is always the is the first one that I you know rewrite from the ground up, and then that that particular engine gets extended to the entire product line. Aquaware 5 is a, is a big undertaking because I'm, I'm rewriting it basically from the ground up, wow. updating everything about it. And with each rewrite, each version that comes out, it just gets more explosive. And, you know, it, people just have amazing results utilizing it. The current version, Aquaware 4, has over 700 intents built in, plus some really cool advanced features. Aquaware 5 will have over 1,000 intents in it. Um, we've expanded the brilliant minds now to painters, to sculptors, to athletes, actors, singers, songwriters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just spans the gamut. And basically what I've done is I, can, I have the ability to capture the frequencies of these people, whether they're living or not. And you can consciously direct that person in the water. And when you drink that water, you take on the best attributes of what the intent is about from that person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely no, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you're sharing this because I want to talk a little bit about uh, the audios that I've made using the same principles, uh, using my voice. Because I grew up in South Africa and I grew up uh, very close to the, you know, I had no television when I grew up, uh, very close to the native culture uh, and some of the shamans and the songomas. And I realized that our, our voice carries the transmission, the frequency of healing. And so I began talking to my patients back 20, 30 years ago using audio, and they would take it home, and they would literally reprogram their intention and their relationship with their eyes. And so we have a whole series of self-healing audios now for every eye condition to help them modify their perceptions while they're sleeping, before they sleep, in the morning, and during the day. So I love your, your concept of intention and, and energy and modifying the frequency very much. There's, and, uh, there's, definitely a, agree with you. there's a lot of amazing ways to do it. I mean, I, I had my wake-up experience, you know, over a decade ago, and 
with each rewrite of the product code, you know, and, and of course the software is one of the services that we offer on the website. We're also in the middle of these master classes now, and it, you know, it just it just it just keeps getting better. I'm coming out with the first physical device, the HFA, the harmonic field amplifier, which is going to be produced in Germany, and you know. It, my head is just so explosive and out there, and there's so much creativity that comes through me, and it's like we don't have enough hours in the day to get it all done. But you know, I just want to keep going and going. I'm like the Energizer Bunny, but you really need to realize that you know you're human and you need the rest. And you know, even exactly. when I'm sleeping, I'm still thinking. And you know, I get Donald will tell you I get very frustrated sometimes because stuff just doesn't happen fast enough. And yeah. I need to slow down a little bit, and we we are in the in the 3D world, and you know things have have to happen in a certain order, uh, and I just need to accept that, but I don't. But <laughs> it's kind of a humbling process for us human beings, isn't it? It's always humbling. I mean, my my entire journey has been, you know, prior to my wake up experience, I didn't have a clue what humility, love, and discernment was. I, really, <laughs> gratitude. <laughs> gratitude was oh okay, <laughs> you know, but. The, my path has taken a personal toll on me. And it, it, it's been huge. And, and, and through those experiences, I've learned a lot. But, you know, one thing I've held true to is the day that this turns to work, I will walk away from it. You know, I joke with Donna and other people, I'm going to grow my hair long. Actually, I was on that path. Grow a really long goatee, put on a Jesus robe and slippers and go walk the deserts for the next 40 years or whatever. <laughs> but... You know, this is fun. This isn't work. I worked on in Wall Street for 20 years in technology. That was work. One of the largest investment banks in the world. You know, I'd get up five in the morning and do that, and then and then do this for another eight hours. So I've I've paid my dues, and now this is fun. This is a lot of fun. Right. It's the way it should be. It's it's all amazing. So, a couple more questions before we yeah. wrap it up. Yes. Yes. So there's some great um, questions here. Um, Patricia, Patricia wants to know: Can any be can anything be done with dry eye issues? Yes, um, obviously there's a normal medical approach, uh, but I think the fundamental question is: Why are the eyes dry? What is drying up in perception? What is drying up in our life? What is old that now needs to be rebirthed into something new? What difficulties and pain have in the past that need to be expressed through either tears or flowing of water? Getting back into the flow of life is the metaphor. So while you use conventional approaches, I think people can also add this dimension to managing the symptom of dry eyes. Ooh, that was that was pretty deep too. Wow, I like that flow. Besides the fact that there are other natural uh, herbal approaches that can be combined with that concept, yes. You know that kind of leads me into that next question, Dr. Kaplan, because Chad wanted to know um, what method or specific fre frequency or plant have you found that will generate generally restore function in the eyes. Well, again, a very complex question because when you analyze it more deeply, each structure of the eye has its own nutritional needs. That means there are certain foods for the retina, for the optic nerve, for the lens of the eye, the cornea, and so on. So I've documented that also in my books where people can find out, especially the power behind your eyes, there's a chart, a table, and if you want to, let's say, increase the function of the lens, then you need to know, well, I have to use citrus fruits. But if I want my retina to be stronger, maybe I need to eat more carotene and carrots and things. What, what food groups you would use um, is the fundamental approach. However, there is a, a remedy called euphrasia. I'm not sure if it's available in the U.S., certainly in Europe, it's a plant derivative, it's a, a herbal plant, and that generally as a tonic for the eyes can be extremely helpful, euphrasia. Very nice. So, Dr. Kaplan, you have some books, and as you said, some audio 
um, programs. Can you just give another shout out to those, um, how people can connect with you there? Because do you do Skype sessions with people? Sorry, I missed that last part. Could you just say it again? Sure. Do you do Skype sessions? Yes. Um, I spend certain hours in the week offering Skype sessions to all over the world. Um, my Skype name is Roberto Kaplan, and uh, that can also people can also reach me through the website and make appointments, uh, write to me. And the self-healing products include uh, it's a, there are generic audios that, like, if someone is nearsighted, they would use a nearsighted self-healing. If they are have astigmatism, they could add that one, or an eye disease like cataracts, they would choose that one. And then they combine that with an audio called Letting Go, which is really important because we hang on to our old perceptions. And then the last intention is in the audio called Regenerate. Uh, we, we have to enter into this uh, intention that we can regenerate. So this audio lasts about 30 minutes. It should only be used indoors, of course, not while you're driving because it's, it's very relaxing. People sometimes even fall asleep, so they have to be careful. Uh, the audios are super. I've been using them for over 30 years now, and I get letters from people <laughs> saying, wow, you know, I've just been listening to your audio, and it's helping me so much in what I'm doing, and, and thank you. And so that, that's a very positive approach. The books are all available through the website, uh, and they are mostly available in the United States. And so yeah, it's easy for people to, to access the material, or me, directly, yes. That's awesome. Peter, do we have time for two more? I have a question for one for both of you. We do. Okay. So play piano on all keys. Wanted to know would there be a Aquaware program to support Kaplan's work? So Peter, that one I guess addresses you. So I, I want to be clear about this. If you want an intent in Aquaware 5, you, you can email it to me at peter.shank at moderndaymystic.com. But it needs to follow a certain format, and that format is the intent category you want it in, a brief description about the intent and the name of it. If you send me a paragraph in an unorganized way, I'll just delete the email because I don't have time to you know, discern. If you send it to me with the name, the description, and the intent category, nine out of ten times, yes, I will put it in Aquaware um, 5 for you. The first beta will be out by April 15th. It will be going through testing. And generally, I have about four weeks of stringent testing within my inner group for bug fixes and you know how the how the energy interacts. And of course, you know each time Aquaware goes through a revision, it's like giving birth to a creation. It need you know it, it, it's a life form, if you will, and it needs to get to know me as I need to get to know it. And then we teach it through the beta revisions. Once we get the RT which is the final version before release. So we're probably looking at the, you know, the end of May, beginning of June. Um, we'll be doing a show around it, obviously, and I'll be showing you all the cool features in it and have some steep discounts. But yes, again, if you want an intent in Aquaware 5, please follow that format. Email it to me at petershank at moderndaymystic.com, and yeah, we can get it. Sure. Then I'm in a do the last question. There's still some questions in there, folks. You're going to need to contact um, Dr. Kaplan on his website or through his... He's also on Facebook, just so you, you um, need to know. He's also on Facebook. And you can also check him out through his website. So, floaters, Dr. Kaplan, anything that can be done with floaters, is there something yeah. that folks should be paying attention to? Well, first of all, to make sure that on, from a medical perspective there's nothing drastically going on inside the eye. Sometimes the floaters can be a degenerative process. So they should check with their doctor first. If the doctor says, oh, no, no, it's just physiological, then they can really do a lot. And that is, uh, like I did before, 
the first question is, what is floating around from the past that has not been successfully completed? It's called floating unfinished business. That can include uh, unspoken communication, broken promises, holding on to secrets, not finishing connections with people, jobs, and so on and so forth. Um, the second thing is if the person is nearsighted, they need to use a far-sighted perception, the intention of looking into the future, because the future can be of a fear-based perception. If that fear-based perception is present for the future, they hold on to that intention, it can aggravate the vitreous body, which is where the floaters are, and the vitreous body just speaks a little louder and says, hey, you guys, you need more stability in your life because the vitreous, vitreous is about how stable are your feelings. The retina is housed behind the vitreous feelings. So it's about stability of feelings. I have had more success dealing with floaters in this form of approach than using any form of medicine or sometimes we use color into the eye and focus certain frequencies, but the audio input that I've just probably the most healing form for floaters. <laughs> awesome stuff. So we are at the end of our show. Dr. Kaplan, you are amazing. Thank you very <laughs> much for being our guest on the MDM show. Thank you. It's been my absolute pleasure to meet both of you and to have this opportunity, and I wish you all the best. As thank, well. you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. Great show tonight. Woo. Thanks for joining us, folks. Next week. Oh, next week we're going to bring back Holly. So Holly Powers Matthews, she's going to come back and chat with us. She's got some new things that she wants to talk to us about, plus probably some readings, I'm sure. We'll see you next Sunday night, folks. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.